Hello, everyone. So today is a second lecture. The previous lecture was that of psychoanalysis, I hope you remember. And uh, today is that in psychoanalysis. And they are, of course, connected. So uh, as I said, for me, this is something that maybe rescues psychoanalysis or maybe not because to rescue to, to positive also concept. Uh, maybe just uh, the essence of psychoanalysis that in my view, uh, in my view, allows it to exist in the best possible way, weirdly. <clears throat> no. um, so as we were talking about Freud, the death and death drive, his concept of the death drive starts to play a major role in psychoanalysis in late Freud. Freud, who is a uh, disillusioned Freud, who is less optimistic, and Freud, um, who starts to use the concept of a death drive. Uh, and we were reading his book, the 1920 book, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, where he starts to pay uh, attention to the, to the concept. Uh, and uh, whoever, unlike the previous early Freud, for whom uh, rather the pleasure principle served as the uh, as a main concept that defined human psyche that defined our behavior that explains who we are and uh, it's not actually true that from 1920 not exactly true there is the major role of the concept of a death drive and before 1920 there is the major role of the pleasure principle it's rather the but still it's possible to say Many scholars are claiming that it is this switch, it's still the major year, the year of publication beyond the pleasure principle that we can separate Freud of the death drive and Freud of beyond the pleasure principle. But he started to develop similar ideas uh, before this work. And, uh, but most importantly, once it introduced the concept of a death drive, the centrality of a death drive in human psyche, he also constantly uh, hangs back goes backwards from this concept. So the feeling is that he's not able to fully integrate it into psychoanalysis fully, although he's trying to fully revise the previous scope of his research, but um, it's still he's constantly going backwards, not being able to fully incorporate. There's something in this concept in the death drive there that it doesn't allow to, uh, to sink it in its, in its full presence. And same with all the researchers almost with researchers who are trying to um, who are trying to introduce again the concept of a death, death drive to see it as a central to see its importance but still whoever you read and we will discuss a couple of them today like Todd McGovern and Katrin Malabu uh, they are trying to uh, maybe do what Freud wanted to do but failed to do to put the death drive in a central place, but they're kind of also and claiming, criticizing Freud that he didn't fully recognize the death drive, didn't fully put it in the center. And still by doing this, they also make this movement uh, backwards from it. There is something in the concept of a death drive that persists its inclusion into the scope of psychoanalysis. But um, it's even worse with other theories, other programs uh, that are not even aiming to recognize what the death drive stands for and only maybe trying to cover it like with the psychology as such except for um, some of the streams of psychology but it's really rare psychology in general um, is trying to precisely avoid trying a way to cover from this the scope that uh, the, the concept of death drive points to same with politics we'll talk about politics today a little bit and um, same with basically any human uh, programs. They are too positive. They're not capable of recognizing the negative core of existence, negative core of humans and negative core of human bond. So Freud before, as you remember, before 1920, we can say that the central principle was the, the pleasure principle for him. The pleasure principle that governs psyche and uh, that means that all we want is 
we want the most, something that directs us, our actions, our behavior, our choices is the desire of pleasure, desire of happiness. And this is the program of the pleasure principle. This implies that humans are babies, infants from, from the beginning. They're already individual self, self-enclosed, narcissistic. They want to satisfy their desire. And this is more or less our common concept, perception of humans of babies, that they have their desires, they're egoistic, narcissistic, and they use others to satisfy their needs. But the other perspective is possible. And we think within economics, for example, we do think about humans as those who want to uh, maximize their pleasures. Uh, and uh, again, the concept of uh, being the idea of being kind of, uh, to, to another, the idea of being altruistic is still, it's impossible. It would be put within the scope of economics, uh, for example, in the, in the idea that it is still rational because we still maybe um, going not directly to uh, achieving our egoistic goals through altruism, it's still rational. It, it doesn't have the possibility, this principle, that all we want is the pleasure, all we want is the uh, satisfaction of our needs. And this is what drives us, our main drive as humans. The concept of altruism would be placed in this, uh, in this egoistic uh, perspective, perspective where egoism is central and still be seen as a sideways to satisfying our needs. For example, that it's, we need to be altruistic for our society to survive. Still altruistic, still doesn't see human as self-sacrificing, as not as wanting something good. You can't be good within this perspective. You can't be someone who is sacrificing. You can't be someone who, who wants to die, right? You don't exist within this perspective. It will just put you back. If you are masochist, for example, masochistic teachers, you'll be put like you were in Freud into the scope of this gives you pleasure. Again, you can't suffer. It doesn't recognize suffering human being and self-sacrificing human being just impossible. It would claim that you do it because uh, this is just the sideways to, to um, satisfy your need or it, it just because it gives you pleasure. There is no way to, for you to be seen as not receiving pleasure, no matter how you suffer, no matter how you love someone and sacrifice yourself, you're still egoistic. Uh, starting from, from birth. Uh, so child cries. Uh, this is the demand, for example, in this interpretation, this is the demand uh, that the need of nurturing has to be uh, satisfied or they're calling their mother who they all want to own, right? So it can't see the child actually, this is pure suffering child doesn't know what it wants, she or he. The child just suffers and scream, meaning and screams meaninglessly because it doesn't even understand uh, who she or he is or herself or himself as a separate being. Um, it's of course exaggeration, but still the basic point is, I hope it's clear. And uh, in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, we can see uh, that Freud would claim that there is, there might be such thing as this primary masochism, that our psyche, what the death drive means, that our psyche is structured uh, in a uh, masochistic way that there might be instead of the desire uh, in humans to pursue happiness and pleasure there might be something in us that is opposite to it there might be the instead desire of uh, of a pain desire of of trauma or not the desire of trauma but there might be something that we do that traumatizes us and we repeat uh, this traumatization and this is what drives us, unlike the humans of pleasure principle. So the primary masochism and the way our psyche is structured. He provides, you read it and we discuss it. He provides a couple of examples of how, so why he introduced the concept of a desert because there was something in a human that he saw, or Sabina Spielrein saw it first, but uh, there was something in a human that he saw that doesn't fit into the explanation when you use the pleasure principle. For example, war veterans, uh, why do they have those uh, re recurring uh, painful memories? Why our psyche is not uh, structured so that we will forget those painful, um, painful 
experiment from our past and just, or at least why, why we not abandon them in, in the past? Why they have to occur all the time? Why they have to be present? What is wrong with our psyche that is present um, and recurring those traumatic memories? What's the point? How is this the pleasure principle? Is it malfunctioning? So um, it doesn't fit. The other thing we discuss is the four dagi, when child actually plays re-traumatizing um, himself, Freud, uh, grand, grandson. So why do we do it from the beginning? Why do we, uh, why do we traumatize ourselves? Uh, do something, something on purpose, do something that traumatizes us on purpose, even when we are playing. And the other example that he provides, we didn't discuss it uh, last time, but it's a patient's, uh, patient in, um, in analysis who, uh, who uh, again, brings the memory, dramatic memory uh, into the discussion, but uh, without allowing themselves to simply leave those memory in the past and see them as the uh, see the, see those traumatic memories as the element of the past without associating them uh, ourselves themselves with those memories. It's still them. It's still represented as it still re-traumatizes. You can't talk about it as the someone else experience. Um, it's still your experience. It still hurts. It still exists as a reoccurring and painful element. So why it has to be reoccurring? And uh, Freud uh, called it demonic power in humans, something, uh, something that is uh, the, the evil may be power. The compulsion to repeat, compulsion to repeat, the other name for the death drive, compulsion to repeat traumatic memories, to re-traumatize ourselves uh, again, the demon in us. And of course, again, Freud uh, hangs back all the time from um, from clearly stating that uh, death drive is central. He still tries to constantly put it within the back, within the scope of the pleasure principle, claiming that uh, some of the examples of his explanation, the putting back into the positive perspective of a pleasure principle is that uh, because those we replay those traumatic memories because we want to be um, in power of what is happening, what is traumatizing us instead of being a passive subject of uh, traumatization and other uh, possible uh, interpretations. In the example of uh, patient in uh, analysis, he claims that there is something, um, there is something, the reality there, there is sleeping um, traumatic reality or rather just the reality, but um, uh, that is traumatizing of who we are, of our history, of the world. And um, something that is, that is not possible to make um, coherent, to include it as a coherent part of our scope of experience. There is always something that is sleeping there and we prefer it not to wake up. So it's always the potential traumatization is always there. It's always operating, causing its uh, effects on psyche. And through analysis, the goal, uh, in some way, uh, in certain interpretation, one of the um, goals of analysis is to bring this uh, something that is sleeping and make it a part of the reintegrated in the psyche, make it a part of a coherent scope of our history. Because trauma is something that ruptures uh, psyche, right? Trauma, when we traumatize, we can't kind of believe that this is us, this happens to us. We can't fully make this experience our own. It's foreign to us. It's, Trauma is something that could not have happened, right? But it's still you, it's actually a reality that is painful to, to recognize. Uh, so it, it's always there, those contradictions in the psyche and the conflicts, uh, unresolvable conflicts in the psyche. There's always, they're always there and they're constituting psyche, uh, which is, mm, which doesn't make any sense if we claim uh, that the pleasure principle is the only one and central mechanism of how human psyche functions. Um, McGovern claims, again, you saw that slide, that Freud discovered death drive in 1920 uh, when he became less optimistic. Uh, 
or maybe as a result. And this disrupted his own writing and the writing of uh, those who will follow him, whatever, whenever they would try to include, uh, to discuss in their writings, the concept of a death drive, they would again make this step backwards, putting it back into the positive framework, their own positive framework. But uh, there is something, something mysterious, or maybe not mysterious, with the concept of a death drive that one can't fully um, stand uh, and try tries to, if, if one deals it with it once automatically, once recognizing it, tries to put the cover on it, not to see, to unsee. And uh, maybe because it is offensive uh, to claim that humans are death driven, hum there is this drive towards self destruction and destruction. Um, there is something that we can't stand in this concept, something that once we recognize, we say yes to it, but immediately we say, but maybe it's not true. There's something in us, it's really hard to recognize and to fully develop as a concept. Um, but again, Sabina Spielrein was the uh, first one before, the one who before Freud claimed that there is such thing as what she called death instinct, and you will have these readings for next time, this reading um, as the cause of coming into being. So she was the one who uh, claimed initially in uh, 12, uh, in 1912, and before she presented a paper, uh, which Freud knew about, but uh, so, but Freud does uh, talk about her mentions her in a footnote to beyond the pleasure principle briefly, but basically she was underappreciated by Freud and uh, only later he starts to, uh, to recognize that there is something uh, about what she claimed is, uh, was actually uh, reason very reasonable. Mm. And she is interesting for us, uh, we'll have time to discuss it. She's interesting for us because uh, for her it's the part, the destruction is a part of reproductive com complex and it's not, as for Freud, um, individual uh, drive, but in more intersubjective drive. It's something that is not within individual, within the subject, but also in between individuals, something that the quality of interconnectedness between, between individuals, not only within us. So relationships uh, are also death driven, not only individual. Freud, again, concentrates on uh, more well, uh, one can question this, but maybe uh, just she concentrates more on the inter intersubjectivity and uh, Freud's accent is more individualistic. So what I want to do today is uh, discuss the concept of a death drive as um, constitutive for individual, which we basically already almost did, uh, because for Freud, it's there is this indi individualistic accent in Freud conceptualization of a death drive, but also to see a death drive uh, of society, of a social bond, of interconnectivity of people together, togetherness, and a death drive of a nature or death drive of uh, evolution. Basically, the death drive as a concept, if you start from it, it um, disrupts whole three concepts. It doesn't, it doesn't see individuals through the perspective of death drive, individual separate being doesn't exist. There is no such thing. Society, maybe it's okay with the society, society is fine, but the nature it disrupts because the very word nature etymologically comes from, if you say that evolution nature is death driven, it doesn't make sense because word nature comes from word uh, to give birth. It's about birth, not about death. And um, because everything we will talk at the last part of the lecture, everything in nature, the way we comprehend nature is about life, development of life, it's life driven. We see it that way. If you talk about death, something death driven, we can't call it um, nature. But, and we, it's questionable if we can call it evolution because evolution initially is always also uh, concentrating on life. It's even defined as an, 
uh, evolvement and development of changes in in nature so it's kind of by including the death drive by seeing them as central for individual society society to less extent and into nature it disrupts even those concepts and the way we understand them the way they are normally developed um, so individual death drive let's discuss a little bit more um, relying on some of the Freudian followers and those who are were criticizing uh, death drive we'll start with Lacan uh, Lacan takes uh, Lacan develops to a certain extent the concept of a death drive but his concept of a death drive his uh, psychoanalysis is uh, he perceives it through the symbolic order it's uh, the main thing for him is symbolic order language and inclusion of human uh, within the uh, within the symbolic order. That's why sometimes Lacan is called post-structuralist. They are all about language and symbolic order and the way the symbolic order defined, modifies, modifies uh, humans. Some wouldn't agree with that, that he is post-structuralist. But um, so this drive he, he uses as a part of this reconceptualization of Freud, the inclusion of symbolic order, inclusion of, uh, of language. Um, centrality of language into the thinking of psychoanalysis. And uh, this drive uh, would function uh, as the part of operation in certain periods of Lacan, as a part of how language operates, symbolic order operates upon a human uh, body, human subject. And uh, this drive is this precisely this inclusion because language kills the body, he called it uh, actual body, animalistic body, he calls it second death. So uh, unlike the first death, that is animalistic death, death of actual body, the second death, this inclusion uh, of a human into symbolic, restricting symbolic order, he calls it uh, second death, symbolic uh, maybe death that is opposite to animalistic death. So uh, society that is, uh, symbolic inclusion of a human into society kills the actual physical body, disrupts, uh, disrupts the functioning of a body. And this is, this is one of the interpretation of, uh, of a death drive. Another, and precisely for Lacan, what he recognized, and he is quite existential in this, similar to, to Heidegger. Uh, this thought is similar to Heidegger, that there is something already in subject there is something already wrong with them. There is this internal crack, the profound perturbation of the regulation of life. Unlike other animals for Lacan, unlike nature, humans are unnatural. There is something wrong with them. There is some, some kind of crack. There is some, some kind of malfunctioning, uh, maladaptation to a nature. We can say that uh, later when we'll discuss uh, evolution, we can say that humans are sick, um, uncurable animals. There is this disruption in them and uh, he associates it with the inclusion in a social order that doesn't let them function in a way uh, maybe animals uh, do, but it's also questionable if possible, uh, there are possible other interpretations of, uh, of uh, Lacan for me. Uh, so it still doesn't make the death drive central. It rec he recognizes death drive, but for him, it's also the language, symbolic order, the center, and death drive is somewhere around to explain how it's traumatizing, how we are malfunctioning, how um, how we repeat. There is the repetition of the of the loss. He would also claim, uh, maybe we will come back to it, that humans are constituted. Uh, around the initial feeling of loss. There is lack, the absence of us in ourselves, the constitutive absence of subject and subject appears for Lacan as self wounding. And only it, it's initially in Zizek's reinterpretation of Lacan. The subject is already post-traumatic subject. Every following uh, traumatization is the re-traumatization. So we appear, the appearance of a subject is trauma and there is the concept of the uh, 
the trauma of birth, which comes from Otto Rank, which who interpreted it in the actual in a way that uh, too uh, close to the actual reality that meaning when we we are, we, are, we are born we are traumatized because we separated from the mother but it's not and kind of like we have this memory unconsciously and um, we start our birth from the trauma but it's more metaphorically it's not that we remember the trauma of birth the trauma of birth of birth of an individual the appearance the feeling that we have of self is initially traumatizing. It's where the self appears in this, uh, it appears as a, as a trauma. So this is why um, this trauma, initially traumatized subject, initially bared subject, the Lacan's sign for a subject is bared subject, crossed uh, subject, because it's initially traumatized and it persists by repeating this trauma, by repeating the feeling of, of loss. Uh, that something something is lost constantly for us, and we can't fulfill uh, fulfill this feeling. Uh, we can only maybe cover it, but re reality is such, or the real is such, that it's uh, of our existence. Uh, the real of reality, the actual reality, is such that it it shows itself. It's the the lack, and it shows itself within our symbolic board, uh, order, within our language, within our thinking as a rupture, something we're not able to compre comprehend, something that is um, you're not able to fully cover in the language and that we feel as anxiety, that we feel as uh, traumatizing us. And this is recurrence, humans are constituted, there is no way to escape it, you can cover it, but uh, the reoccurrence of this lack, the recurrence of trauma, the repetition of the trauma and repetition of the loss, initial loss, uh, is uh, something that is constitutive. We do have fantasies uh, that cover these losses, that, uh, that everything is going to be good in our life, that we won't be traumatized, that we will be healed, that we will be coherent in the narratives of our life. But it's just the fantasies to cover this initial, the impossibility to, to get rid of this basic uh, repetition compulsion. And this is the different perspective from, for example, the perspective of psychology, which psychology is from this point of view. Um, illusion that tries to, that gives a hope that the getting rid of the death drive of this repetition, that is not constitutive for humans, that it's a sick version of a humans. And, but from the standpoint of psychoanalysis, it functions as the fantasy, which also helps because it's a fantasy to, um, to cover the loss, which is impossible to cover, which still is reoccurring, which still exists in it because it's structural. And Lacan kind of um, recognizes it. Also, Jusans, I don't like this term, but Zizek would claim, uh, we'll talk about Malabu in a while. So next slide. Uh, her elaboration of a concept of a death drive. And that it's not enough, not sufficient. And uh, Zizek would criticize Malabu with her criticism of uh, death drive. And he would claim that um, in psychoanalysis, there is all, all, already something that is um, that covers this idea of, of omnipresent pain. And it's the idea of Jewish the Lacan term of, of Jewish sons, because it implies uh, the dialectic of certain uh, impossibility of pleasure without pain, or maybe that there is always, uh, there is already um, whatever. So uh, the pure pure pleasure is at the same time uh, suffering, right? It's uh, pure pleasure doesn't exist at the same time suffering. And there is this dialectic of pleasure and, and pain. And this is the tragic, um, tragic fate of, of humans. It kind of covers uh, covers its all, but um, again, so because Jewish the human drive, already drive towards pleasure, already includes pain, this concept includes pain. For Zizek, it's uh, not only for Zizek, uh, it's something that already covers this duality of uh, pleasure principle and, and death drive. But 
and it kind of includes they claim the death drive the centrality of the death drive or at least it doesn't try to avoid it because it is tragic whatever there is um, pleasure it comes with the pain and this is tragic fate of human but there are a couple of interpretation of the death drive the way Lacan uses it but with Jewish sons and he, Lacan would openly claim that Jewish sons is the best towards uh, death but the problem with the Jewish sons it doesn't in my view uh, step out or not enough from the centrality of the pleasure principle because it still presupposes that we are pleasure driven creatures what we want is pleasure but it's this pleasure, uh, we're still egoistic, um, but this pleasure kind of always uh, is not, a, we're not able to satisfy it. And we feel suffering precisely within, within this pleasure. It's beautiful, it's tragic, but it still, it starts from the, the pleasure principle. It doesn't see it as uh, the pleasure principle is something that never works, always interrupted. And this interruption is the, the pain and the, the Jewish sons. But we still, the, the basic start is that we are, um, we are, there is this pleasure principle. And there's also um, Lacan's, Lacan's um, kind of e equates here the animalistic state of human uh, or for animal of a natural state, with, which he tends to see as a pure, um, as a pure. Uh, Jewish sons, and it's he initially equated it with a pleasure. So he still had this romantic idea that there is uh, sometimes, so, sometimes he doesn't, uh, that there is this initial Jewish sons understood as a pure pleasure in uh, nature, and humans uh, deviate from, from it. Or there is something maybe Jewish sons is human, equated with a death drive, but there is still this pure pleasure in, in nature and humans are disrupted uh, sick animals that have this weird death drive thing, uh, which is not true in, in, in certain other interpretations of, of Lacan. And Jewish sons, I don't like it because it has world word joy. Uh, if you translate it directly from French, it's uh, translated as a joy and it has connotation with sexual joy. So it, it precisely, you can't talk about death drive, you can't put the centrality of the death drive using uh, the word that is translated as a joy, plus as a sexual joy, because you, again, you bring not only the centrality of the joy here, but centrality of, uh, centrality of sexuality. And so let's maybe uh, just keep, it's beautiful in the way it's tragic, because it, it only uh, kind of promises, looks like pleasure, but it's actually not, but still it needs uh, additional explanation. It doesn't, and many people um, do associate, associate the Jewish sons with just the pleasure without understanding um, the role of necessity of pain with it. They could use uh, Jewish sons in different ways within Lacanian even psychoanalysis, one that entails suffering and maybe suffering of uh, Jewish sons of nature, um, pure Jewish sons, that it's not suffering anymore. So it's questionable if you can use, give the centrality to death drive uh, using this word, the word that suggests the centrality by its very definition, the centrality of the pleasure principle again. So let's go to Catherine Malabou. She is a contemporary uh, researcher, philosopher, and neuro uh, philosopher, and she was the one and he's the one who is criticizing uh, Freud's mostly, but also Lacan um, concept of a death drive, claiming that they were not able, especially Freud, go as he claimed beyond the pleasure principle. So death drive is supposed to be beyond the pleasure principle, and Freud failed in Malibu interpretation to go beyond the uh, to go beyond the pleasure principle. And um, so what she, she does, she endeavors uh, to go beyond of a Freudian, uh, beyond to actually discover the death drive, the destructive powers to see them as central, to give them space within the discourse. And she, 
Mm -hmm. She elaborates the concept of destructive plasticity. Destructive plasticity is uh, the concept that precisely serves this aim to actually see death drive. Uh, it's Freudian death drive plus it's actually <laughs> death drive, right? Something that you don't put back within the scope of a pleasure principle, within the scope of coherent, within the scope of possibility to be um, to be uh, deleted from the from the psyche. Uh, you don't see you see it as basically to see it as constitutive. So destructive plasticity is death drive. Freudian death drive, Catherine Smalabu uh, term for Freudian death drive, but it's better than a death drive, right? It's actual death drive. It's actually beyond because it's even beyond of the beyond. What does it mean? It means that Freud, uh, according to Malabo, and I do uh, partially agree with her mostly, uh, Freud was not able to see destructive powers, the powers of destruction, catastrophes, and different ruptures traumas as self-sufficient. He was not able to see the collapse of a psyche uh, as something that has formative power. For him, the, all those negative sides of existence, negative sides of psyche functioning, they, they, um, they seen as obstacle. And if it's an obstacle, it's still within the scope, the general positive scope of function of psyche. Like there is the coherent, harmonious function of the psyche and there come disruption and uh, if it's a disruption it's still within the perception that it can be overcome that it can be somehow maybe or explained or um, reintegrated those trauma those structures and um, again this uh, handing halting backwards from the what is recognized and Malabo claimed that it's not only in Freud it's neuroscience too and neurology too Whatever they dis discover, and there is a concept of destructive uh, plasticity, unlike coherent, positive, normal plasticity. When we all talk about plasticity of the brain, we mean this positive plasticity. We pay attention. We see generative processes, positive processes as central. Um, forgetting, uh, claiming that negative processes, such as um, the death of cells, uh, apoptosis, or the uh, the long-term depression of neurons, uh, of synapses, we see them as secondary processes in comparison to, um, to generation of, of neurons, for example. Uh, we don't see, we are not capable with our perception, everyday perception, scientific perception. It's very hard for us to see negative processes, destructive processes as central. We have this perception, if we'll get rid of them, uh, psyche will be healed, or brain will be healed, but it's it's not true because there are lots of destructive processes in the brain that are constitutive. Like without apoptosis, for example, the pre-programmed cell death, death uh, cell suicide, the organism wouldn't function. They have to die. They are they they are. This process is as important as generation of new cells, the death of cells. So we um, we kind of not able, our mind is structured, thinking structured in such a way to not to see destructive processes, see, to see them as secondary, to see them as something to avoid, something to get rid of. We don't understand their generative power. We don't understand that they are, um, they are constitutive and they are important. So what Malabo does, she tries to, uh, she tries to see destructive processes of psyche and brain in their own right without putting them in a larger scope as something, because when you see the, these processes discuss them, destructive plasticity within neurobiology and neurology, they are seen as subject to cure. So we kind of see traumas, we see, uh, we see them, but only to unsee them, only to, in a context of healing, something to heal. We never discuss it on their own. There's always this need to, to uh, get rid of them, even in a discourse, to proceed to the recommendation, what to do with them. They're seen as abnormal, they're seen as deviation. They're not seen in their own rights. And she was the one who claimed that Freud is not even able to see masochism in its own right, um, because precisely he, he, whatever he discovered, whatever, whenever he discusses, according to Malabu, death drive those destructive powers he immediately or maybe not immediately but after some time he put them 
or in the scope of the pleasure principle of a healing of those positive in a positive framework. And uh, masochism and sadism um, are seen as uh, something we enjoy, something we are able to incorporate uh, self-destruction self that we are destruction of other, that we are able to incorporate into the pleasure principle because there is ratio to this. It is the rationality to this from the perspective of the pleasure principle because we feel pleasure. So, uh, and psychoanalysis would, uh, mm, would not even recognize uh, those patients, the people who are, uh, whose psyche is traumatized so that it's not able to restore it, that it's not able to, uh, that it's not possible to heal it, to cure it. Someone, because after certain traumas, for example, there, there appear, appear a completely new self, complete disruption from the old self, people uh, just might not remember their names, right? So, um, and psychoanalysis recognizes, the perspective of psychoanalysis, according to Malabo, recognizes as its patients only those who can be restored, who can talk, and through talking, uh, talking about traumas or discovering those traumas, they can reinstall the coherence of a self, the coherence of a, a life, narrative, and those who are not able, those who are the products, the way uh, she, she called them, of destructive plasticity, they would be considered not the appropriate, something wrong with them, they're not um, good to be patients of psychoanalysis, they are just, uh, they're supposed to be patients of uh, uh, neuropathology, right? So the psychoanalysis doesn't see those people, uh, people with actual brain traumas who will never recover, who will never, uh, who will never uh, restore the coherence of, of their old self or severely traumatized patients who will, mm, who, who has a self, a new self, but it's a self that is traumatized. It's a self uh, established as a rupture from the old self. Is the post-traumatic subject, um, but um, and Malabo called those people living figures of death. So to give you maybe understanding uh, closer to Earth, uh, the one who inspired her this thinking, the person was her grandmother who suffered from Alzheimer disease, and observing her dying, um, she was not able to recognize her. So it's it's actually still. Um, the old person is still her grandmother, but it's completely at the same time, different person. The person uh, whose psyche, uh, whose brain is a product of destruction and Malabu called those people. And she wants to develop a framework that would talk about one of the, those figures of death, uh, figures who are not the subject of recovering, figures who has a self who exists, but they are, mm, they're not recognized, they're recognized as a deviation of normality, how normal brain plasticity has to function. She wanted to develop a framework that would explain them, that would, give, uh, would be able to see that destructive uh, powers in psyche are actually producing self, are actually functioning to produce something, to produce certain forms uh, outside of the framework that we normally use, a uh, framework of cure, Right framework that is not able to capture those those people those types of processes in the psyche, but she called them monsters. She calls them product of evil. Those uh, living figures of death, someone who is living death while uh, they are or kind of already dead and be, being still alive. But problem with her is that she 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 does recognize this better than uh, maybe Freud and her endeavor to to. Um, to put into words the formative power of uh, death drive is great, but she still tends to, her step backwards is that she tends to, again, see this group of people, mm, uh, the traumatized people, uh, severely traumatized people with PTSD. She sometimes mentioned as example of this monstrosity of the destructive plasticity as a product or the monster of, as a product of destructive plasticity or people with Alzheimer like your grandmother. But uh, she, 
not always able to see uh, the destructive as constitutive as universal as the that all of us are those monsters and uh, i told her that, that uh, she she wrote this book right to mentioning her about destructive plasticity mentioning her grandmother and obviously uh, there was a trauma of observing the person she loved changing so much dying and it traumatizes her and Malabu was this experience uh, it wasn't it again it's trauma that constituted her too and she talks and she tries to delimit again to, to protect maybe herself or us delimit the scope of operation of destructive plasticity only to a group of people like one of whom is her grandmother, that they are product of destructive plasticity, product of those traumas, those who are, will never be healed, those who, whose idea of healing is not even appropriate to talk about them. But she never includes, maybe she does for herself, but in the book it presented like it's a group of people that are products of destructive plasticity. It delimits it to this group. It doesn't see it as a universal, uh, uh, universal principle, the death drive, that it's maybe in Lacan, it is uh, intrinsic interpretation better in this way because every subject as such is already post-traumatic subject. It's in her including with precisely this experience of knowing her grandmother uh, before Alzheimer and after Alzheimer, after her death. It's something that changes her, right? It's a traumatic experience that you're not able to fully comprehend. You're not able to fully reintegrate into narrative. It's still traumatizing you. Uh, traumatizing you. So uh, for me, I would take the concept of destructive plasticity and extend it to all the people. And this is what she told me not to do precisely because the way she uses it directly. Um, but it's a very good concept to, to do it. It's plasticity as such is, uh, is destructive. It's not only about those people. The question here is how we separate people who actually have uh, serious conditions like Alzheimer or post-traumatic stress disorder or uh, survivors of war or disasters of rape, how we, dis uh, how we um, distinguish them from us, maybe people who live in here, who are capable to, who are here today, who are capable to come to a lecture. So maybe less dramatic, but still it's, it's not the, it's not that our plasticity is normal and their plasticity is destructive plasticity. Our plasticity is destructive, is destructive too, but maybe we're coping with it uh, better. Like we're pretending that our, we don't have this trauma. Those traumas are sleeping in us, but they're still constitutive. They still try to think about yourself as a, as a children and, uh, going through potty training you know you can't associate yourself with this old you it's traumatic uh, childhood as such is traumatic in life what the memory is structured so that uh, we remember better something that is traumatizing something that we're not able to fully reintegrate so um structural plasticity for me is plasticity as such is something that constitutes human and each is the monster um with more or less mechanisms, developed mechanism and ability uh, to cope with those traumas. And Phineas Cage, maybe you know about him. Uh, it's the example, this, the most known, uh, the most known patient of uh, neuropathology with neuropathology. So in 80, 1884, uh, he, he was a worker on the railway, building a ra railway. And he, because of the accident, this huge metal stick that he's holding went into his, you see where, into his head. And uh, it was taken out. His brain was damaged, obviously. Mm, it was taken out and he still survived, uh, but he changed radically. Uh, he, he, was, he still looked, except for, he looked similar to what he was, physical body, but uh, his character ha has changed. Some features, uh, how he related to people, uh, his work attitude. So Cage wasn't Cage anymore. It's kind of a semblance. It looks like old Cage, 
but uh, something changed in him, something that was hard for his colleagues to relate for him, something that changed in him that it was hard for him to sustain his, uh, to keep his job, to uh, stay with his wife, uh, obscene language. And so cage wasn't cage anymore. It's still cage, but it's not cage. And this is the standard example how the structure between, and Malabu uses uh, him too. Uh, the rupture between old self and new self. So um, again, if destructive plasticity is universal plasticity, there is always this rupture. So there is no continuum, uh, not only in patients, not only in cage, but also in people who we consider normal. In psychoanalysis, there is basically no, the normal is a certain type of neurosis and psychosis that is more favorable. But uh, we would say that this is universal principle. This, the old self and new self, they exist. There is a rupture between them. And subject doesn't exist as a coherent whole. There is, it's, it's always post-traumatic uh, subject. It always structures, uh, it's always structured as the, as the rupture with itself. There is something in us that we can't fully, fully relate or the absence of us uh, first of all, the lack of us, of subjectivity uh, and comprehension of this lack, the wounding comprehension of this lack, something that establishes subjectivity. So it's this lack, the repetition, and of course it goes forever until we die, old self, new self. There is this lack, the repetition of rag, the repetition of ruptures and non-coincidence of old self, of our story from the past, a certain moments, uh, and non-coincidence with our new self is something that establishes us. And we repeat repetition compulsion, this traumatic um, events, and we change as a result of it. So we can say, and uh, there is a great concept from Zizek, absolute concept of absolute recoil, uh, which means that uh, it's not the continuum of development of a narrative, narrative of history or narrative of ourselves, our life stories or history of the world, history of a certain society, but they're, they're always around this lack, around of, of ruptures with itself, the total annihilation of, uh, of itself. And this new self, when we go to psychotherapy, for example, we, what we try to do, we try to reestablish we talk about our childhood. We try to reestablish, to make it coherent, to reintegrate these ruptures into the coherent whole of our. So we do it retroactively. Retroactively mean by going backwards. Jezik to explain this, Jezik has a great example with how um, how history changes, how past changes, and it does changes. And now we know that we modify our memories. Memories are always new, and they always fit the certain. Uh, so past is also, also produced uh, within the present because there is the need to cover the structure between the old and the, and the new. And Zizek example is with his Slovenian philosopher. So it's about Slovenian traditions that suddenly after a certain period of Slovenian history, they, uh, they, they introduced a historical costume, traditional Slovenian costume, and suddenly the whole, <laughs> the whole, uh, the whole history was interpreted like it existed, this tradition existed before. It was started to be seen through this framework. So, uh, and we do, and we start to believe in it, Slovenians, and start to um, uh, establish their identity based on those invented traditions. Traditions are always invented, and there is all, uh, always the reinterpretation of the, the past, because we try to cover the rupture. There is something to cover that we do it. But what is constitutive is precisely lack. The rupture, the lack, the non-existence, trauma, something that doesn't fit together. Uh, for example, something traumatic happens in your life, you can't relate to it, you can't believe in it, and you need to put the framework on it that will interpret it in a positive way that will cover it for you. Like that, for example, that it makes you stronger. It's good for next experience of even fail, uh, fail again, fail better this Beckett principle that I, I love, but it's still positive because it, it recognizes failure. Life is a, a consequence, the consecutive line of failures, not a line, but the chain of failures. 
what you can do, you can manipulate those failures, do something with failures because they are inevitable, right? Life is a failure, right? Life is a repetition of trauma and you can modify precisely this lack, trauma, the negative aspect, but still fail better. It's again, it's putting back into the, uh, into the perspective of the positive perspective. So truly negative would be fail. You can't even say anything. If you say uh, fail worse, as a life principle, it's still, you know, you know what to do. You, you use this experience as knowing what to do. And even if it's knowing what to do, even if it's what to do, you have to fail worse. It still gives you direction. It still gives you certainty. certainty. It's still you, quite coherent to you. So even negative uh, principle of failing worse doesn't work like that. Even the suicide, when we are so traumatized, when we can't exist anymore is so painful this traumatic self the absence of us that we are not important that we are uh, so when we when we see this reality the, the real the traumatic real the anxiety that goes with it when it's so vivid when we have suicidal mood or uh, some severe form of depression when we actually see this we are not able to cover it to cover it with coherence to make it a part of our story we can't live with it we are became the, the post-traumatic subject. And even the suicide is the positive project because it, you know, there is something to do. There is some hope that it will help to, to escape the pain. And it will help, but precisely it ends only with the end of you, right? The whole this mess of, of, of life, the whole repetition of trauma that is constitutive to you. So there is a way out. Um, the dress drive in society. I will base my thinking on McGovern because he's great. Mm. So what McGovern did, and we're gonna read him, I think. We'll have presentations, I hope. So what he did, he included dress drive into the political thinking, which is uh, great and insane because he tries to do it at least because political thinking, uh, according to him, uh, is impossible. The death drive doesn't go together well with the political thinking because political thinking is also always a positive program. It's always a program of improvement, betterment, and that gives that gives hope in a future that's going to be harmonious, uh, harmonious society without any trauma structures. And he claims that. Um, uh, we need to, it's too romantic, we need to include death drive to be more realistic and think of the social bond of a society as best driven, as not uh, inevitable. Because again, all the thinkers that almost, well, all, even McGowan to a certain extent, um, who, who were trying to include the death drive, they do this step back, not recognizing it to the end because maybe human thinking is structured as a positive project. It's structured for a betterment. We think and implicitly the goal of our thinking is betterment and finding one way out. Thinking itself is hopeful and it's very hard to introduce something actually hopeless into the way our, how we think. So political, political thinking hard to combine with uh, late Freud, Freud of a death drive, because it tends to be um, any social program, not only politics, it's tend to be a positive program. And here McGowan is also great because he, it, this, some, this is something that equalizes uh, the two opposite sides, for example, the leftist thinkers, Marxist thinkers, and uh, pro-capitalist thinkers, it kind of, uh, they both, suck <laughs> because they are positive. They are not able to, uh, even though they are opposed to each other, but they are not able, they're still both positive projects. They're, and progressive thinking and conservative thinking as well sucks in the same way, even though they are opposed to each other, like dramatically different. One conservative is to preserve the old order, to come back to old order, and progressive thinking is to uh, develop something better in the future to progress, constant progress, uh, but they still are positive uh, projects and positive uh, kind of ideologies that does not, uh, that are aimed for betterness and aim to cover 
the luck, the death drive that is uh, at the heart, at the core of society. They, they don't see the luck, the ruptures, the conflicts, which are structural for society, the, some contradictions within the society. The wound of the constitutes subject and society, they don't see it as uh, constitutive. They try to, they suggest project how to avoid it. The ideology is something that always covers it, doesn't see, doesn't uh, let recognize it as structural. Death drive in us as structural. It's positive project either by to go to either uh, the idea of going in the past in con like conservative project that um, it sees as this fantasy of uh, that there was harmonious past when people didn't suffer when there was harmonious social bond or go somewhere in the present in the future for more progressive thinking and the future is we won't suffer we will not be as driven we won't have those constitutive locks so what McGovern does, he actually tries to include something that's impossible to include in a pol political thinking. And he suggests that the, the negative program of psychoanalysis, instead of um, the positive program of everything else, in positive program of science, positive program of psychology, positive program of our everyday thinking, which is uh, all ideological because they are positive. So negative program of psychoanalysis, the program of an, um, late Freud, uh, which who is disillusioned, doesn't talk about cure that much, who is disillusioned in the efficacy of a cure, right? So psychoanalysis starts to be basically pathetic and death driven. And, uh, but because of this, because of this not, uh, because there is no orientation on a cure anymore, but there's something else what psychoanalysis is talking about. Uh, and because psychoanalysis and Freud um, presumes this uh, co conflictual, contradictory part, painful part of the psyche and death drive of humans as constitutive, uh, he's, it's not trying to escape it. Well, it tries to escape it, but to a less extent than the other types of thinking and other programs. So psychoanalysis, this type of disillusioned psychoanalysis is a, um, the negative program of psychoanalysis. And for me and for McGovern, this is, uh, this kind of psychoanalysis is the, this kind of program, negative program of psychoanalysis. It doesn't offer a cure, but precisely because it's not within the, positive framework of cure, aiming everything into something positive, finding a way out. But um, because it is pathetic, but precisely in being pathetic, being disillusioned, it, it's able to capture, uh, to capture the, the nature of mm, the this constitutive part to understand humans better because they are as a uh, drive, as a, mm, as the death driven creatures and understand um, social bond better because social bond in uh, the uh, interaction between people are also the relationship between people are also death driven. So the negative program is the only program that captures the essence of humans, considering that the essence is the death drive and essence of uh, of. Uh, social bond. And maybe because of that, it's able actually to promote it, to sustain it, to preserve it in the space of preservation of what constitute, uh, constitutes us. Because psychology, for example, all it offers is not to see. All it offers is a cure from traumas. It doesn't see trauma as, uh, as constitutive. And the same uh, dramatic side of human relationship and the traumatic um, kernels uh, into social in in the social form so uh, this is the late freud that mcgovern mentions the late freud from civilization and its discontents who claimed he, that he doesn't offer a consolation and all political thinking does and political problem does is offering consolation freud became brave enough to claim that there is no consolation that this is not about a consolation. Uh, it's precisely bad news, finally, uh, not a good news. There is no 
like within this space of not offering consolation, there is no but yet. We just say yes to death drive, to the painful experiences, but there is no, mm, no <clears throat> consolation. We don't proceed to, to positive project. So McGovern recognizes the death drive as a central for, for, for subjects, but as well for society, for the social bond. And he tries his best not to step back from it, understanding that the rest did, and actually see it fully as, as the central for, for both, and not offering hope that one day uh, it's going to be different, that these traumas are not going to be constitutive, that the lack, the loss is not going to repeat, that repetition compulsion will stop. All the ideology, what they do, they do offer uh, consolation, they do offer being a positive project, they do offer hope for McGovern, he doesn't, he actually sees it. Um, so what he offers is not a hope but recognition. The death drive for him emerges with subjectivity itself as the subject enters in the social bond and becomes a social and speaking being by sacrificing a part of itself. So it's like uh, one of the Lacanians reinterpretation of Lacanian reinterpretation of a death drive. That subjectivity is initially wounding uh, the uh, self-wounded subjectivity. It, uh, it appears in a dialectic when it enters the social order and at the same time it sacrifices itself and at the same time it's non-existence. Uh, it's non-existent and it sacrifices its own non-existent existence to the to the social bond and this is how it appears uh, let's see next it should be easier to understand so the sacrifice he discusses um, a lot and the subject that is about to appear gives nothing something that he doesn't he doesn't have uh, the initial loss that founds and this is the initial loss that founds subjectivity uh, so social bond is the seeding of nothing. Uh, so initially subject doesn't, there is this dialectics of, uh, of society and subjectivity. If some uh, frameworks of thinking would recognize that subjectivity exists first and then we add human are added to each other and they constitute a society. So first humans, lots of humans, uh, then they, like John Locke would think, for example, some neoliberal thinkers. There are individual first, and maybe Freud in certain interpretation. There are individual egoistic with their needs. Then they come together. There are substances. Uh, there are substances as subject. Then then those subjects come together, and the their connectedness with, between them. The secondary project is this process is a society. There are pro-social thinkers who would think, tend to think the opposite that. There is no separate subject like Marxist. There are um, historical consciousness and subject are just the part of it, the illusion, but basically we all connected. Um, society is first and the and subject is something secondary or historical consciousness is first ex experience historical and then it's separated into subject. For McGovern, uh, he claimed that only psychoanalytic thinker not only, but psychoanalytic th uh, thinking is capable to recognize that neither subject nor social order exists independently, but instead emerges out of uh, each other's each other incompleteness. So again, this is basically two same uh, pictures. One shows this the connection of subject to a su subject and the other subject to society in general, but the society is subject. So. Society is also constituted, connected through the lack, right? Where uh, the lack of, uh, they exist, one is non-existent with, with the other. Subject is non-existent, uh, is non-existent without the society. Where one ends, the lack of the one is the existence of, is the presence of the, of the other. And they are connected through the whole, the whole, Subject is the whole, subject is absent subject. And the narrative stories that we telling ourselves is that we're trying to, is a fantasy that we're trying to cover 
the absence of ourselves and through giving ourselves as the absence to the society uh, sacrificing ourselves to the society we first of all occur as a subject and constitute a society so again this this idea it's not that simple as in just one subject plus the other subject complete presence of two subjects or more is society it's again through the luck through the repetition of uh, of uh, of a lack of a trauma and it's traumatic so this space between them it's constitutive again repetition of the it goes forever <laughs> a repetition of the loss what dialectical loss of the, the loss of society, the loss of subject that constitutes both. No? <laughs> okay, so maybe on a psychological level, it's easier. This is why the sacrifice plays such a role in, um, in Magawan. Because what we basically sacrifice, and sacrifice for him is a constitutive uh, ritual uh, that um, constitute society that is very important historically for formation of societies. When we sacrifice, we always, this is the destruction, the power of destruction, we sacrifice ourselves and this and sacrifice nothing that ourselves are recognizing it. It's traumatic, it's destructive, something is destroyed, something is given. Um, and this precisely the ritual of sacrifices that forms around this destructive processes that social bond is historically Formed. And this is the repetition of death drive, of the repetition compulsion that constitutes society. And it's painful. Um, it includes uh, the pain because it's giving the part of us, giving something from us to the other, and basically how the social bond between two subjects is constituted. We need to give, sacrifice our time, sacrifice our attention, sacrifice our way of thinking, to interact with the other, but at the same time, we are imaginary entity and our main trauma is that we don't exist. So we are sacrificing basically nothing. We are giving what we don't have and what we share with each other is not some something substantial, but basically we share the, the absence, we share the lack. And through this lack, around this lack, the rim of this lack, we are connected. No. <laughs> um, so it's the is the luck that connects us, the sharing of nothingness. If to simplify it and to go to a psychological level that it's easier to understand is that um, we truly understand others in our when in, in their tragedy, right? When we offer solutions. It's, it's helping maybe, but we are not understanding the, the core, the uh, uncurable tragedy of someone's life. When someone is traumatized, um, and tra tra if trauma is the core, the re repetition compulsion is the core of who we are, we only are actually, um, we only are actually understood when, uh, when we are understood in our tragedy, in this lacks, that we understood that we are, well, to understand other, you, to understand other, others are understood only if you don't understand them, but you're there for them. So when you share this lack of, of the, the rupture, of not understanding the anxiety of the other, the suffering of the other, this is where we actually connect it. But again, to connect uh, love in, in codependent love relationship, to connect fully is to kill each other, right? To destroy each other. And this is the core of love because it's non, non-existent, it's destructive. Where you come to coincide, you self-destructed because you come to coincide with the core of who you are, and this is the non-existent self, the rapture. Um, so love and death, they kind of go together. And uh, the only way to sustain it is not to go to fully to the, the core of something that connects because of core of something that connects is complete destruction, is absence of you and absence of relationship. But like dancing around the emptiness that connects is what we call relationship, human relationship, social bond, relationship of friendship, love, and stuff uh, like that. So it's not that we connect it, we connect it through the luck and through the repetition of the of the luck, the repetition of the rupture. And I have 10 minutes to explain the death drive of um, evolution. 
It's maybe a less interesting one, uh, but Alien um, Kazupancic, uh, in her recent books, book on sex, my um, PhD advisor, she actually claims that um, she criticizes to a certain extent one variant, the standard variant of interpretation of Lacan, who suggests, again, I think I told you, that in Lacan, the way you can interpret him, there is this animal uh, who is uh, self-sufficient, harmonious with nature, whose needs are satisfied, uh, who is not disrupted from the nature, like humans with their social border, with their malfunctioning, uh, humans as sick animals. But Alenka criticizes this perception of Lacan, claiming that it suggests that the death drive is the, and this in interruption, this withdrawal from the nature, coherent nature, harmonious nature, human is detached from it, put into the social order, malfunctioning as an animal, sick animal. And uh, death drive would be a name for it. So, but by uh, defining death drive through this as, as something that differs people from animals, from the rest of nature, we claim that in nature, there is no death drive, that it's a human fear that we are sick, constitutive, cons constituted as sick, as constantly traumatized and there is nothing we can do with it. But if it's only human feature, the, uh, the nature as such is not death driven. Everything is good in the nature, just something wrong with humans. And humans are exclusive in this way, which is um, human-centered perspective. And I don't like it because I think Analienka in her interpretation of Lacan would claim that it's not true, it's nature that it's sick. Everything is sick, it's not, not only humans and not only certain types of animals, but uh, any animal, any process in evolution is can be seen as death driven. So she uh, she uses the Zizek's idea and reinterprets the Zizek idea of constitutive, which is like any an idea, um, constitutive incompleteness of reality. It's not that humans are, incomplete, our psyche is structures, the death driven. There is a certain constitutive lack that we are repeating and this is how we establish ourselves, our selves. But reality is such, including nature as a part of reality is incomplete, is established around the lack, established around the re uh, repetition of the lack, the repetition of a catastrophe, of contradiction. There is certain contradiction within the reality, not only our psyche, can be, that can be never resolved and constitute nature. Nature is death driven. Mm. Nor normally understood, nature would be seen as positive life project, evolution as a life project. This is how we discuss it at school. If you're lucky enough to study it at school instead of studying Bible, and how, uh, how this process is represented in a religious way. Uh, so evolution is perceived as development and enfoldment of life. Everything is better. Everything is more harmonious. Uh, the, the one who is the fittest one survive. And the best uh, traits of organisms that are favorable for environment survive. Kind of a natural. Uh, it's life driven, but it's conventional, normal understanding of evolution, but more progressive properly psychoanalytic understanding of evolution would equate uh, more evolution with the death drive seen maybe um, we can use word sur survival of a disaster there is evolution is disaster catastrophe driven there is this element in evolution that repeats there is not enfoldment of life but certain interruption of enfoldment and this interruption lack a rapture of nature with itself can be seen as central, as a repeating, repetition compulsion of nature. And uh, Richards, this great paper, criticizes Darwin, claiming that Darwin uh, didn't change radically, even though his perspective is opposed to Christian religious perspective of uh, coherent narrative of life, that everything is getting better, the hopeful one, uh, life enfoldment. Uh, he claimed, Richards claimed that Darwin was still theological, that he just reconstructed this uh, biblical understanding of um, the implicit, implicitly understanding of nature. It's still life-driven, positive project. 
And Darwin himself was disillusioned. And he claimed later that he um, cannot avoid uh, the conviction that the inner tendency to progressive development exists, that he was not the idea of progress. He lost hope in the idea of progress as he observed uh, evolution became disillusioned in, in it. So, and now, but we still, the conventional understanding of evolution that we study at schools is progressivist, like it's getting better, which is not uh, true. Stephen J. Gould would claim that um, compare, um, Stephen J. Gould is evolutionary thinker who would take uh, father this pessimistic, uh, pessimistic uh, Darwin. And he, he would claim that uh, he would, uh, do you know what is this? <laughs> uh, this is Alice from Wonderland, the cricket uh, game. He would claim that evolution rather is not positively oriented, like something, the improvement something. And there is no, uh, some mechanism that within the evolution that helps to improve life. Um, but evolution rather functions as this cricket in, uh, with the queen, in Alice in Wonderland. There is a game, there is a winner at the end, but no one knows the rules. Like rules are invented while, while the, the game is played. And another gold uh, concept is a concept of acceptation, which is really important for, for evolution. And again, disrupts this idea of, uh, of evolution as driven, positively driven, because acceptation means some features that are uh, first were used for something else, uh, like feathers, and then uh, started to be used in, a con in, in organism to serve the completely different function. Like uh, with feathers, it was first used, you know what for? Not for flying, like we associate it now, that feathers appear for birds to fly, right? It's obvious, but it's not true. They first appear for thermal regulation. They had nothing to do with flying. And then there is this moment of disruption of the old self of a feather, old meaning of a feather as it serving the function of thermal regulation. It's meaningless. <laughs> and then functioning as, uh, as uh, to help birds to fly, for example. But there is this moment of rupture, you see? The acceptation, not adaptation. Like there is the function and we need to, uh, there is the adaptation of organisms. There are certain features developed to adapt. No, it's not like that. There is a rupture in a feather of its old meaning and a new meaning. And we might retroactively claim that, uh, you know, it were developed so that uh, birds could fly, but this is this, the retroactive uh, imposement of a coherence of the story. It's not so. There is the, this different processes of of a lack of uh, non-coincidence with itself in the evolution, hopeful monster. And so the idea is that we are all monstrous, that monstrosity and mutation play the, in Goldsmith's uh, hopeful monster hypothesis, that um, mm, mm, mutations are important uh, and for different species, new species that differ from other species, this is why we separate them from different species like humans and apes. The difference between us um, is because, uh, according to this hypothesis, uh, there was a monster, someone, um, someone deformed in comparison to the previous set of uh, features, set of genes, and they survived magically, even though it was a very small chance because they are deformed. Uh, monstrous mutate, mutated uh, to a great extent. It, it's small chance for them to survive, but those who survived by miracle, they established a new, uh, the new species. So the, again, the idea, the hopeful monster, the idea is that there is the, the structures in the evolution that is not, um, not positively driven uh, process. And basically the word terata, which, uh, which means monster, is a great to explain the process of evolution as such. And from its etymology, it's also mean, it means monster, but it's also mean charming, wonder. And it means from, it comes from root queer to make, to form something. So it maybe it's a great word to describe not only who we are, the monsters, but to describe the work of evolution 
we are monstrous, we are mutants, and it's um, evolution works through the ruptures, through um, through non coincidences, through catastrophes, through through lapses, through non coincidence of the old history and the new history, and um, so evolution itself is monstrous, as well as we are in our society. I will see you. Thank you. I will see you on the seminar. Thank you. Thank you.